We're talking again today about Lacan's notion of the big other, the symbolic other. And uh, this is the third installment of a series of mini lectures on that topic, and I've given it the title of The Other Scene. In doing so, I'm hoping that we can put in place some links to the work of Freud. Just to connect where we left off last time, I'd emphasize this idea, Lacan formulates things in these terms, that when we're thinking about this notion of the big other, the functions of the big other, we should bear in mind the idea of a second degree of otherness. The second degree of otherness is one of Lacan's ways of trying to suggest that the other, the big symbolic other, is not simply the specular image, the mirror image, our imaginary counterparts, the little others, other people that we come into contact with every day. He's trying to suggest that we're dealing with a second power of otherness, a greater degree of alterity and otherness. And one way of trying to emphasize that is his move to say that the big other can be thought of as language itself, as the treasury of the signifier, kind of collect, uh, collectivity of words, of linguistic norms, of uh, signifiers. Now, the more we do that, the more we emphasize this notion of the symbolic other as language in and of itself, you could say that it feels like Lacan is doing a kind of linguistic thing. It seems that he's moving away from Freud in some respects. And I just want to take a few moments to suggest that that is not necessarily the case. If we're going to suggest that the symbolic other is the uh, battery of signifiers, the treasury of signifiers, the collection of words, that also helps us reiterate an idea that we spoke about last time, and that is the notion of the mother tongue. The mother tongue, little m, big O, wants to suggest that every time we speak, the big other has an opportunity to speak through us. What other voice speaks within mine? This is a question that I've uh, sketched up on the board, just as a kind of clinical question to bear in mind when one is doing psychoanalytical work. What voice is, what other voice is being spoken through the analysand's voice? And I suppose we could ask the question about ourselves as well. Every time I speak, what other voice, what other meaning, what other implication is being mobilized by my speech? So although Lacan does sound like he's doing something that focuses very much more on, on language, uh, you could say that's one very important way to call our attentions to the ambiguities of speech, the slippages, the implications of speech, because there's always potentially an other speaking through our speech. But of course, there's more than one way of making the link back to Freud. Lacan is going to go on to suggest a number of different ideas, some maxims, some uh, formulas for thinking about the unconscious. And I think this is where the concept of the other gets particularly interesting. One of the famous formulas he'll go on to offer is this idea that the unconscious is the discourse of the other. That fits very well with what we've just been saying about the other voice that speaks through me. But this notion of the unconscious as the discourse of the other actually has a really pertinent and um, uh, very apt link back to something that Freud says. So let's just quickly emphasize that idea. In uh, one of Freud's texts where he's talking about the unconscious, he makes the following comment. And uh, just to let you know what book I'm uh, reading from, this is my own book, Six Moments in Lacan. And uh, I'm going to cite Freud, and then I'm going to also cite Josh Cohen, who's a, a, a London-based psychoanalyst, and who's got a, a great little book called uh, How to Read Freud. But first off, here's one of Freud's most well-known descriptions of unconscious phenomena. He says, all the acts and manifestations which I notice in myself and do not know how to link up with the rest of my mental life must be judged as if they belong to someone else. They must be explained by a mental life ascribed to this person, end quote. So here Freud is suggesting that there's a whole series of acts of unexpected utterances, of implications in my speech, uh, errors that can be almost ascribed to someone else they're ascribed to someone else, and as much as they don't fit my own ego's understanding of who I am, I didn't mean to say that, but that's just a dream. All of these moments, we seem to be ascribing these enunciations, these expressions, to someone, some other. Josh Cohen then comments on the quote from Freud, and he says the following. 
When I speak, I am simultaneously unknowingly ventriloquizing this someone else, someone both radically distant from and tantalizing close to me. It is this someone else that goes by the name of the unconscious. Now, I'm not sure whether Josh Cohen is, is making those comments in a way to set up a reverberation and echo of sorts of Lacanian ideas, but whether or not he intends to, I think he's doing it very nicely. In other words, we do have a kind of strong Freudian grounding for thinking about what Lacan is going to say, the discourse of the other. In a way, you could almost say that's a, a Freudian formula. And although maybe we're pushing it a bit too far here, I think many Lacanians would kind of do this move and say, well, you can already see the beginnings of this concept of the other in Freud himself. Great. One other moment that we should just be aware of. Lacan talks about the other, as we've seen. <clears throat> There's another interesting echo to, to Freud because Freud talks about the other scene. The other scene is, in, an, in a sense, the place of the unconscious, the location, the, the site of fantasy. It's a recurring and quite evocative phrase that he uses, the other scene, for where the unconscious phantasmatic images, understandings of our mental life could be conceptualized as occurring. So let's keep that echo in place as well, the notion of the other scene in Freud and Lacan's notion of the big other. And towards the end of this, this brief talk, we'll, we'll try and put those two things together. We'll try and overlap them. Let's move on now, though, and pose a problem. You could say that in the history of how different people have opted to take up Lacanian psychoanalysis and Lacanian concepts, we sometimes have a bit of a bifurcation. And what I have in mind here is that different types of literature take up the concept of the big other and use it in slightly different ways. Now, what I have in mind, for example, is, at least in part, some of the work of Slavoj Žižek, and I'll make a, a brief quote from his How to Read Lacan um, in a few moments. And without disparaging this work in any way, I know some uh, more clinical Lacanians are, oh, it's all too political, or whatever. Um, you could say that how, how the notion of the other is utilized often in Slavo Žižek is it's utilized as a kind of location, a reference point um, of social norms, social, social, uh, the rules of the game, this type of depiction. For him, it's also an important reference point in the broader project of ideology critique. Now, I'm not going to try and be critical and, uh, and claim that there's some kind of simplifying going on because Žižek's work is complex. There's a great multiple different way many ways of dealing with this concept of the other. But just for the point I'm trying to make at the moment, you could say that one often has a feeling that the concepts are slightly different, the big other, as it's utilized in forms of social critique and more uh, social forms of, or social political forms of Lacanian theory and how clinicians use it. So just want to mark that point and then point to this problem. This may already have started to feel like a contradiction for, for, for some of us as we've started to list the multiple and different types of uh, many definitions that we've given for the other. So on the one hand, I've stressed that the big other can be seen as the mother tongue, our mother tongue, the treasury of signifiers. It can be seen about language, right? Here, it seems very much about linguistic functions. It seems about the place of how language works. Remember also the notion of uh, the third in any dialogue. That makes the big other sound very much about linguistic phenomena in a sense, which is important because it also then means that the big other can never be simply identified with in any imaginary way. But let's keep that in place. A whole series of maxims and many definitions of the big other want to emphasize language, signifiers. But on the other hand, we've also stressed that in many ways, the big other can be thought of as the locus of the truth, as a point of authority, a point of appeal, as a point of arbitration, as the rules of the game. Now that sounds somewhat different. I suppose one starts to get a sense of, is there any reconciling of these two approaches? Why is it the case that the big other is simultaneously often the treasury of signifiers, but yet also the rules of the game? Don't those things sound slightly different? So here we have a, a brief reference to um, 
an admittedly introductory and quite basic um, description of the notion of the big other. And you'll see in how Slavoj Žižek is taking up that point that both of these facets come into play. And of course, the reason I'm asking this question is to see, is there a way we can reconcile these two seemingly different elements of the big other? Big other as language itself, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the big other as locus of truth, which starts to equate the big other and law, social conventions, social customs. The big other, in a way, as uh, uh, the location point of a whole series of social values. And those may be said to sound slightly different. So this is um, in the first chapter uh, of, of Zizek's How to Read Lacan. He says, the symbolic order is society's unwritten constitution, is the second nature to every speaking being. Uh, these are ideas that I was trying to uh, allude to in previous sessions when I was speaking about Robert Redford getting lost at sea in the movie All is Lost. In other words, that the, the symbolic order of language is far much more a part of our private uh, individual isolated thoughts and, and than we may imagine. Back to Zizek. The big other operates at a symbolic level. When we speak, or listen for that matter, we never merely interact with others. Our speech activity is grounded on our accepting and relying on a complex network of rules and other kinds of presuppositions. Firstly, there are grammatical rules. Then there is the background of participating in the same life world that enables me and my partner in conversation to understand each other. He continues, the symbolic space acts like a yardstick against which I can measure myself. This is why the big other can be personified or reified in a single agent, the God who watches over me from beyond, or the cause that involves me, freedom, communism, nation, and for which I'm ready to give my life. While talking, I am never merely a small other, an individual, interacting with other small others. The big other must always be there. So there's a whole series of points we should stress there. Number one, that whenever there's speech, whenever there's interaction, whenever there's thoughts, whenever there's linguistic thoughts, the big other is there. Okay, so the big other is not something one can kind of separate oneself from in as much as one is a speaking being. The other question that seems to, to emerge here, or the other observation that seems to be important, is that to speak, in as much as to speak implies a set of grammatical rules, means that there's some kind of social convention, some kind of agreed rules for how to use speech and how to interact. In as much that is true, then whenever we speak in a way that is publicly intelligible, we are reiterating and reinstantiating the big other. So there's no singular I, you could say. In Lacan. Whenever there is a speaking subject, there is always an other. So, I, singular subjectivity is never divorced from the big other. Whenever we speak, whenever we utter something, we bring about an other. An other there starts to become the kind of common denominator that makes communication possible. And I suppose this is how I'm trying to get around this apparent opposition between or contradiction between these two approaches. Whenever there is language or symbolic convention, there are rules. And if we have rules, then we simultaneously have a position of the speaking subject, which brings about a big other. Speaking, speech is itself the condition of the other. And when the big other is there, we as human subjects tend to want to personify it. Or, as I've noted here, we tend to want to imaginarize it. And here we have a nice example of us being able to use some Lacanian concepts from the earlier sessions to try and understand something. So let's reframe that one more time. The symbolic activity of using speech necessitates rules. It necessitates rules, therefore, to speak, to have a communicative interaction implies the presence of a big other. But given that we're dealing with human beings and humans who have a psychic life, by the time there is a locus of rules, there is a locus of uh, what is right and what is wrong, we tend to institutionalize and imaginarize that. We like to give a face to that set of rules. We personify it. That's why I think Zizek has been quite useful here when he says, well, it's almost as if uh, when there is the possibility of a big other, and we know to speak, to use language at all, is to bring about the possibility of the big other, that big other starts to be personified, typically in the instance of a god, an authority. Uh, and I've given a bunch of examples here. First example, 
you could say that by virtue of speech, you have an authority, you have the grammatical rules, which then leads to the personification of those rules and the personification of them in a sense of a place of expertise, a place of authority, a place of truth. You could say then that human subjects almost have an instantaneous gravitation towards instituting an other, towards instituting a position like that of God. You could make that argument. And we can now think of a whole series of interesting little empirical examples of that. But one, I think, to start at the end here, is that I'm thinking of a whole series of television shows in American popular culture from the West Wing to this valorization of the presidency. That there's some fascination we have for the leader, the position, the persona, who gravitates to that position of the other in that political system. Doesn't mean, of course, we don't have lots of fights about that, lots of uh, antagonism towards it, but it seems that we have this allure, or that position has some kind of allure to us, and that we spend a lot of time. This is also a key point. It's not just that the other exists in some kind of objective form, as always existing. It's that we play our part in the supposition that another exists, and in populating, projecting values and ideas onto this other. Which leads me to this example here, Mind the Gap. If any of you have ever traveled on the London Underground, you'll be familiar with this, this kind of mindless uh, mantra, which is often replayed when you're about to get onto the train. Mind the gap. Mind the gap. So there's this voice, and it's basically telling you to watch out. There's a gap between the train and the, and the, and the platform. And it goes, mind the gap. And some British artist, I think it was, decided to do this series of interviews with a whole series of people riding the train. And she said to them, I think it was a she, what comes to mind when you hear this, mind the gap? What, is the, what does this person look like? And um, <clears throat> if I'm getting this right, what she then did was she got them to try and describe what they thought this person was like, their imagination of the mind the gap guy. And she does like a little identity kit, like when you go to the police and you say, oh, I saw this criminal doing this. And they say, describe him. And then you have an artist and they draw the whole thing. So they came up with an imaginarization of the mind, the gap guy. Love that. Great, great artistic project. But I think it's a nice illustration of the fact that when we have the big other, which at moments in Lacan is simply a function of language. It's simply a function of language. It's not a psychological entity. It's simply a function of the symbolic system. But the crucial caveat, as soon as we have that function in the symbolic system, human beings are going to want to personify it, give it a face, to imaginarize it. And moreover, not only are they going to imaginarize it, it's also going to be the subject of a whole series of projections and transferences. It's going to be invested with values, invested with phantasmatic investments. In other words, with fantasies, with understandings. So anyone who's ever had the position of being elevated to, I don't know, the Prime Minister of Great Britain or something, is presumably going to know all about that. You start to get all sorts of kinds of letters. People hate you. People love you. Irrationally, extremely, you become the subject of transference, to use the classic psychoanalytic term. Which is also why, as Lacan works and reworks and adds to his notions of the big other, he has this little notion here, I've just um, abbreviated SSK, the subject's supposed to know. The subject's supposed to know is one way of underlining the fact that the way the concept of the big other works as a kind of operation within human subjectivity is that it becomes not just the point of appeal, the point of authority, the locus of truth. It is all of those things, but we tend to imaginarize and give a figure to who occupies that space. And that process of projecting, of transferring, of giving images and values and a hierarchical importance to that position, which in many ways is irrational and in many ways is more us than it, you could argue. That's what he calls SSK, subject supposed to know. And the subject supposed to know is a formula he uses to understand the notion of transference. And just to back up a little bit, transference is the phenomena which Freud is, is struck by in the earlier days of psychoanalysis when he starts to realize that his patients, his analysands, are treating him or loving him, maybe even hating him, having irrational, extreme responses 
where they seem to transfer an earlier important childhood relationship onto the relationship he's having with them. Hence the word transference. There's a transfer of a kind of relationship. You could say that the unconscious is playing out a relationship on a given relationship. So let's come back then. We have made a whole bunch of points. We've stressed that there's a series of links between Lacan's idea of the big other and how it's utilized in Freud. We've also stressed that different literatures, which are trying to do different things, the Slavoj Žižek project of ideology critique and political theory on the one hand versus the use of the other in more uh, focusedly clinical literature, they seem to utilize different facets of this concept. I've tried to argue that you can see how they come together. And the crucial bridge here is to think of it as both the big other an operation of language that also then becomes a vector of transference, uh, an imaginarized position, an imaginarized location. It's not totally imaginarized, it's kind of an imaginary uh, treatment of uh, a location, a locus of truth, and so on and so forth. So I've tried to show how those two things go together. And just briefly to say something about the face of God. I'm no theologian. I don't know much about world religions. But I think it's safe to say that there are some religions where one is prohibited from showing God, from showing the face of God. And in an interesting Lacanian interpretation of those situations, you could say that's kind of a, a useful rule because put in Lacanian terms, it's almost like saying don't imaginarize God. God is not to be imaginarized, to be simplified, to be reduced, to be given this consoling function of an imaginary image. God's not that. So although we can imagine a kind of push against that, where we have you know, treatments, uh, children's versions of the Bible, where God's like this old guy with a beard and the clouds or whatever, you can imagine that there will be attempts to an imaginarized God. And of course, what I'm saying is that in human subjectivity, human societies, there's often precisely such imaginarizing attempts of the symbolic function, the symbolic operation of the big other. We can also appreciate that why in some religions that would be prohibited, disallowed, considered very problematic. So let's close then with two crucial assertions, two crucial points. One, the other is in part an effect of transference, of our suppositions, of our projections. Strictly speaking, the other is virtual, a trans-subjective presupposition, a function of sorts. Um, there's a, a, a really nice set of quotes where, um, I suppose I'm actually citing myself here, where uh, I, I try to make exactly that point. I borrow a little bit from Zizek, but I try to just substantiate the idea. Here's a quote again from uh, Six Moments in Lacan. We as subjects constantly call upon, reiterate, and thus reinstate the big other. The other is though, however, strictly speaking, virtual in nature. We're constantly topping up that symbolic function, that symbolic operation of the other to give it a kind of face, a kind of imaginarized understanding. Slavoj Žižek affirms that this big other is what he calls a transsubjective presupposition, which only exists insofar as if we act as if it does exist. I continue to comment, we need the other, no doubt, but the other, other likewise needs us as believing subjects if it is to operate as a functional principle. So just as the other cannot be reduced to the imaginary ego dimension of each individualized subject, point we made in the previous lecture, it is also true that the other itself, as an operational principle, cannot be said to function without subjects. Okay, so just to keep that in mind, this idea that the other is, in a sense, our supposition, our hypothesis, our operational hypotheses that we constantly reiterate and emphasize. That leads to what we could consider to be partly our closing point. If this other is at basis, a symbolic operation that's engendered by the very fact of using a symbolic system in speech. We can try to imaginarize the other. We can try and imagine the other as epitomized in God, as epitomized in some presidency or, or, or the operation of the judge or someone who dispenses law or someone who is very important or someone who's very famous. All of these things are kind of momentary instantiations of this operation of the big other. And you'll note in how I'm trying to describe things here, the operation of the big other. It's an important qualification because 
instead of thinking the big other as kind of monumentally, statically reaffirmed in one guise, I think the Lacanian point would be to realize that there isn't actually a definitive singular static big other once and for all. The big other is more of an operation than, uh, a, than a figure, than a person, than an, a single instantiation. Having said that, we can then say also that we're constantly trying to put a face on, trying, constantly trying to get our coordinates. What does, who is this other? Who is the other in this given social situation? In other words, what are the governing coordinates of importance, of value, of meaning? The other then, once the operation is working, remember this idea, object is, uh, the other is also, the subject supposed to know, means that we're involved in a constant guessing game. What does the other want? What does the other want of me? What's important here and now? What do other people seem to want? Other people, perhaps a whole community, and perhaps a whole community can, at some instances, take on this function of what the big other wants. Imagine stepping out into, onto a stage and you've got a thousand, ten thousand people looking in front of you. That would be one way of instantiating this nervous, anxious operation whereby one starts to question, what does the other want? How do I keep them happy? What, what should I be saying to get some kind of positive response? So to cut a long story short, and this is what we'll start in the subsequent lecture. What does the other want? This is a kind of primal question. It's a question of how I might locate myself relative to what I think the other of this social situation wants, what they may want of me, and how I might gain some value, how I might be recognized in terms of this other and what the other wants. So I noted right at the beginning that there are moments in Freud when he talks about the other scene. The other scene is a kind of location, a place, a fantasy. And when Freud is speaking like that, it often sounds like the place of fantasy is an image, a scene, something that one can observe, a tableau. But what we start to get a sense of here is when Lacan starts to reformulate some of these ideas. And for him, you could say the elementary question of fantasy, the elementary question of fantasy that drives our motivational energies, that keeps us engaged with the social domain and keeps us guessing about who we should be and how we should be and what we should want, is that question, what does the other want? So in a kind of neat way, having posed that echo of otherness, the other scene in Freud, and the big other in Lacan, we can now see how Lacan's many different formulas of responding to the other, what the other is, the inscrutable other who's never simply easily uh, encapsulated, who I can never be sure of exactly what they want, that becomes the basis of a whole series of questioning, maybe sometimes partially conscious, maybe sometimes we're aware of it, but presumably a great deal of those questions are not fully conscious. And that trajectory, that constant reiteration of what does the other want? What does the other want of me? What does the other desire? That stream of questions and how I try to come up with answers to the questions, that itself gives us an introduction to what we could call a basic Lacanian theory of fantasy. My fantasies emerge in response to the question of what the other wants and what the other wants of me.